How do you build a supersonic fighter plane from scratch? The answer can be found at Avro on the edge of Malton Airport near Toronto. This is the Arrow, Canada's first supersonic all-weather plane. And the birth of the Arrow came only after fantastic effort and ingenuity. In many ways, the Arrow fathered its own assembly line. Two weeks ago, CBC News magazine brought you film of the first test flight. Now we go behind the assembly lines to see the birth of a supersonic plane and the birth pains of a production line. Exclusive to News Magazine, this is the first public showing anywhere of these previously secret films. The dart-shaped arrow began as a streamlined idea in 1951 for intercontinental defense. In theory, it was to be the highest flying and fastest plane ever built by anyone at any time, anywhere. Then, three years later, and a ton of blueprints later, the paper plane evolved into a miniature working model. Here in the wind tunnels, the arrow could have died at birth, but the tests and exhaustive analysis by electronic devices confirm the aerodynamic theories of the men behind the drafting boards. Spin tests also proved the design was a sound one. Flight was the next step. A somewhat larger and improved model was fired into the air by a rocket. The test models were rocket propelled to supersonic speeds to simulate flight conditions in a full scale aircraft. The models were instrumented to measure performance and stability and to transmit the information back to the ground station. The arrow grows. This plane will never fly. It is a wooden mock-up that duplicated the real plane down to the last rivet. The engineering mock-up provided a three-dimensional check on installation clearances and general accessibility. Meantime, the ways and means of producing the new plane were matching paces with the rapidly maturing aircraft. From standing start, the assembly line was developing. Each lesson that was learned from the wooden and later from the metal mock-up was taking form on the floor of the big Avro plant. The idea was farther to the plane, and the aircraft was literally pulling itself up by its own technical bootstraps. The engineers at Avro experimented with new techniques, adapting plastics for insulation of the metal skin. Thus the metal that will enclose 38,000 parts is tested for strain inside and out. The metal is tortured in every way to show up the slightest weakness. <laughs> 
Slowly, the miles of wiring and thousands of parts are beginning to make sense and are passed down the line to the assembly bay. But first, everything is tested, preheated, cold and stress treated. For the arrow is expected to approach close to the heat barrier, man's next step toward the realm of outer space. The Arrow is the first production aircraft in production before it was flight tested. Careful planning made this possible. But while the Arrow takes shape and the assembly lines grow, each step is recorded on IBM memory machines. And mistakes weren't allowed to filter down to the production line to other CF-105 aircraft. In the wake of first Arrow, along the production line, other sister aircraft, four of them will follow. They all resemble their earlier prototype but will be powered by the Canadian Iroquois jet engine and will outpace anything yet made in manned aircraft on either side of the Iron Curtain. Pilots were also taught the airborne characteristics of the plane even before it was out of the hangar. Even the ejection seat procedures, the pilot's life raft, were practiced long before the plane reached the first flight stage. Now, after seven years of planning and four years of work, 17,000 blueprints and $200 million, the Arrow is ready to fly. come off the arrow, a calculated $200 million gamble leaves the ground to carry Canada into the supersonic age. Avro and Canadian engineers have proven they can make paper planes fly. <laughs> 
Following a record-breaking test flight near Toronto, Canada's Aerojet Interceptor is damaged in a landing accident. Airport officials explain the mishap by the fact that the plane's parachute braking mechanism failed to open, causing the pilot to put extreme pressure on the wheel brakes. The brakes burned out, and with smoke and flame shooting from the undercarriage, the jet careened off to one side of the runway. The pilot was uninjured. Just a few minutes before the accident, the Arrow, Canada's fastest aircraft, smashed all airspeed records except one, but security regulations prevented disclosure of the exact speed. In Canada, the wraps were taken off one of the most ambitious aviation ventures ever undertaken in this country. The Avro Company CF-105, or as it's called, the Arrow. Without intercontinental ballistic missiles, the CF-105 was scheduled to be the most important instrument of air defense for the next 10 years. Now, this may not be so. In any case, when the Arrow does go into service, it will compete with any manned fighter anywhere in the world. In April 1959, Ottawa sent instructions to destroy the five arrows that had flown and all the work on the assembly line. Men who had worked to build the planes were now ordered to cut them to pieces. As to who issued the order, whether it came from cabinet or from a bureaucrat, no one is telling. In Mr. Deaton Baker's uh, memoir, he, I think he said that, uh, that he was not aware of these instructions. But uh, I was aware of them because I was the fellow who received them. And like an idiot, I, I folded. And so I'm the person that issued the instructions to destroy the airplanes. And that's the worst mistake I ever made in my life. Cameramen were not allowed inside the plant to record the destruction. But one enterprising photographer rented a plane and took this series of aerial shots. They were cut up with torches in the, in the hangar there and hammered down with steel balls like they destroy buildings. After the aircraft were dismantled, the pieces were sold to a Hamilton junk dealer for six and a half cents per pound. At 67,000 pounds, a scrapped arrow would have cost you $4,355. A few weeks earlier, a request for one or more of the arrows had come from Britain for use in flight testing. The request was not refused. It was simply withdrawn, presumably on advice from Canada. Three could have been flown to England with two more to be used as backup spares for the first five we had flying. Canada wouldn't let them go. I mean, the reason is obvious. Had those airplanes ever got to Farnborough, and Farnborough realized the fantastic performance, I mean, Diefenbaker in no way ever justified his cancellation of that program. And I'm sure that's why they were never let go. Well, the five arrows that had flown, and for which there was uh, uh, some interest on the part of the Royal uh, Aeronautic Establishment in Britain, they would want, wanted to take a couple of those and, and work further on research with them. Those were destroyed. Those were cut into scrap. Well, there, uh, I, I can't give you the detail now of the uh, issues that went into the destruction of a particular uh, copy. But I can tell you that, in general, there was no deliberate destruction to do away with the arrow. Far, far from it. It was just a case of what was the economical way of disposing, at that particular time, of uh, various copies of the plane that were in various stages of production. And as you know, the, what happened after that, it was just like a de-Stalinization program. We were ordered to destroy all film on the, all original negative film on the Avro, Avro, all the uh, still pictures, black and white, all stuff that had been developed during the flight test phases of the airplane. These were, Ottawa's instructions were to destroy these. They ordered us to destroy the airplanes by breaking them up. And uh, I think uh, the day I saw that uh, production line being put to the cutting torch, it's the nearest I've come to shedding a tear over an airplane. It was pathetic. Looking back on this extraordinary event, the scrapping of the arrow still seems an act of either inspired malevolence or of criminal stupidity. <laughs>
a mocking epitaph to the work of the men and women who built her. Did you see any aircraft being destroyed? No. No. I could have if I wanted to, but I didn't. I couldn't. I don't think any people wanted to go and watch such a massacre. Frightening sight. You could say it was just a plane, but over the years, the Avro Arrow has become a symbol of national pride. The jet was a casualty of the Cold War, scrapped by the Diefenbaker government in the 1950s. But nine test models of the fighter did survive. Now the search for them has become a fight itself. Here's the CBC's Raj Alawalia. In the cold, dark waters of Lake Ontario, there lies sunken treasure and Dave Gartshore is searching for it with some state-of-the-art equipment. Yeah, what we're seeing right now is the bottom of the lake. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Gartshore found something he'd been after for years. This is the uh, two exhaust rings or exhaust ports that are on the back of the model. It's covered with zebra mussels, but this underwater video clearly shows a three-meter long scale model of an Avro Aero one of nine strapped onto a rocket and fired into the lake during tests in the mid-1950s. Gartshore says it may not be worth a lot of money, but in some ways, it's priceless. Oh, this is the top of the heap. It's a stack. Oh, yeah, this is right at the top of the pile. It's, yeah, this, the recognition, the, the significance. I mean, everybody knows about the Arrow. The Avro Arrow was a masterpiece of aviation technology, a source of Canadian pride, better than any military plane of its era. But in 1959, the Diefenbaker government cancelled the project, saying it had become too expensive. And this is arrow number six, the last of its kind. Number six and the other prototypes were ordered destroyed. All that was left were memories and those test models. The race to find the first model of the arrow at the bottom of Lake Ontario is over. But another contest is just beginning, this one to determine who owns it. Even if somebody finds something on the bottom of the lake, it's technically not theirs anyway, whether you found it first or not. What the hell is that? That appears to be another Avro Aero model, one filmed by Saunders Group just days after the first one. He says not just anyone can go out searching for historic artifacts. The fact that somebody was doing it improperly is, is a matter that the ministry has to, to uh, address. That someone is Dave Gartshore who says he didn't know he needed a permit to look for the models. I feel I do deserve a bit of recognition for finding the first confirmed Avro Aero model. On this model... Palmiro Campana has written a book about the Aero. He says the dispute over who found the models shouldn't detract from their significance. Uh, you have a very small model in a very large lake and a lot of interesting technology, I suppose, that's gone into uh, finding it, uh, just as they did with, uh, with the Titanic. No matter how the dispute is resolved, Dave Gartshore and his rivals say they'll be back on the lake searching. After all, there are seven more models of the Avro Aero somewhere out there. Raj Alawalia, CBC News, near Brighton, Ontario. Her lines were sleek and powerful. She was designed to kill, to seek out and destroy an enemy bomber. She was the most advanced, the most sophisticated weapon of war conceived and built in Canada. She was the Arrow. That was over 20 years ago. On a February day in 1959, the conservative government of John Diefenbaker canceled the Arrow program after five of the aircraft had flown. Today, there are no arrows, only models, pictures, blueprints, and a few broken parts in a warehouse in Ottawa. And there is film of the Arrow in flight, smuggled out of the Avro aircraft plant near Toronto in defiance of a government order to destroy not just the plane, but seemingly all evidence of its existence. After 20 years, the arrow is still remembered, and the questions remain. <laughs> 
Why was it really canceled? And why did the government wish to eradicate its memory? The tragedy of the Arrow, like so many tragedies, began in hope and optimism. At the end of the war, Canada was in a position to become one of the world's leading manufacturers of aircraft. The A.V. Rowe Company, formed in 1945, was a symbol of faith in the future. We had been building Lancaster bombers for war. Now we would build both commercial aircraft for peace and fighters to protect the peace. The architects of this policy were a canny Canadian cabinet minister, C.D. Howe, and directors of the British aircraft firm, Hawker Sidley. Among them, Sir Roy Dobson, the hard-driving Lancashireman who had virtually created the Lancaster bomber and who now became Avro's first president. The company's first general manager, here on the right, was an impatient young Canadian, Fred Smy. Avro brought together a talented team of young designers and engineers, many of them from England, like James Floyd. The age of the jet was beginning. But before the tragedy of the Arrow could unfold, another disaster was in the making. In 1946, the company embarked on its first project, a four-engine passenger jet which they hoped to sell to Trans-Canada Airlines, later known as Air Canada. TCA was intrigued by the idea of being the first North American airline to offer a jet service. Intrigued and perhaps frightened. They were troubled by the jetliner. They didn't think they could make a profit on it and eventually withdrew their support. The company then tried to market the plane in the United States. There was a triumphant publicity flight to New York, carrying the world's first jet airmail. And the New York Times said, Uncle Sam has no monopoly on genius. Now, National Airlines ordered four of the aircraft, with an option on a further six. It was too late. The Korean War had started and C.D. Howe ordered Avro to put its whole production effort behind a new fighter for the RCAF. Howard Hughes leased the plane for six months and used it as a personal toy. In 1957, the same year Boeing captured the market with its 707, the jetliner was broken up into scrap. Between the jetliner and the Arrow, there was one success story, the CF-100. In 1949, Avro had begun work on a new fighter. The National Film Board chronicled its birth in screaming jets. Behind locked doors, Avro Canada worked to fill a top priority order from the Air Force. And now the reps are coming off Canada's hush-hush night fighter, the CF-100. The CF-100 was a twin-engine, two-man, day-and-night fighter, the first built in Canada to the RCAF's own specifications. It was eventually to be powered by the company's own Arenda engines. With the failure of the jetliner, Avro were now dependent entirely on military contracts, and the stakes were high. In the expectant stillness of the hangar, the men who built the plane are tense with excitement. Each man wonders, had they miscalculated somewhere, or will it scorch off beautifully into the sky? Behind that sleek black question mark lay years of hard work and headaches for all of us. And there were a few headaches to come. In 1951, the CF-100 was still a long way from its successful future. But it did bring into the company a handful of brilliant test pilots. Spud Potocki, a Polish air ace. Peter Cope from Gloucester Aircraft in England. Jack Woodman with the RCAF, who came later. And Jan Zurakowski. These were to be the only four men to fly the Arrow. Zurakowski could make the CF-100 do cartwheels in the air. And one day, he even pushed it into a supersonic dive. But in 1951, another man was to have an impact on the fortunes of Avro and the Arrow. Crawford Gordon had been a protege of C.D. Howe's. At the age of 37, he came to the company as president and general manager. Together with Sir Roy Dobson, he built A.V. Rowe into a complex of 39 companies. 
To Sir Roy, he was like another son, a son he would eventually disown. After Gordon's arrival, the CF-100 entered squadron service with the RCAF. Ultimately, Avril produced nearly 700 of them. But already the Air Force knew it needed something that would fly higher and faster to keep pace with the new Russian bombers. And in that knowledge was born the Arrow. In 1952, Avril came up with design studies for a new Delta Wing aircraft. The CF-105 was to be a supersonic twin-engine two-man interceptor capable of engaging the enemy at 50,000 feet and carrying missiles and rockets. It was a whole new concept in fighter technology and it pushed Avro's design team into finding solutions to problems never faced before. Jim Floyd was now vice president of engineering in charge of the overall design of the plane. Problems were legion on the Arrow. Uh, we had a problem, for instance, that the wing skin temperatures at 50,000 feet, where the aircraft was to have its combat capability, were 40, 50 degrees higher than the boiling point of water. Yet inside of the wing, you had the fuel, which was cooling it down. So the differential temperature was trying to distort the wing. And we had to tailor and design the wing so that that distortion was compensated and didn't affect the aerodynamic capability of the aircraft. There were to be no prototypes. Avril was going straight into a first batch of pre-production models, and testing was elaborate. Scale models were fired by rocket into Lake Ontario to test aerodynamic qualities. The CF-105 was now called the Arrow. We had to be dead right first time. There was no flying a prototype, finding the problems on it, then reflecting the, that back into the production drawings and issuing modifications. You had to be right, and yet you had nothing to fall back on, no real experience to fall back on, on the design of this aircraft. As the program developed, there were some unanswered questions that were to have a crucial bearing on the Arrow's fate. The RCAF had not completed studies on the weapon they wanted the plane to carry. Robert Lindley, chief technician, came up with an unusual solution. Uh, one feature of the uh, Arrow, the uh, weapon bay, you may recall that the whole weapon bay would lower out of the airplane and go back in again. And I put that feature in there because I couldn't find out what weapon we were supposed to be carrying. So I said, okay, I'll solve the problem, you know, I'll make a detachable portion and take your time, make up your mind. When you're ready, we'll put it in there. And uh, it was a nifty feature, I guess, in the end, but uh, that's really why it was done. While Lindley was coping with the unknown weapon system, the arrow began to take shape on the factory floor. A workforce of some 14,000 men and women translated the engineering drawings into a reality of steel, aluminum, titanium, and miles of electric wire. And as the pace of work quickened, the liberal government of Louis Saint Laurent began to notice the mounting costs. In mid-1955, C.D. Howe told the House, we have embarked on a program of development that gives me the shudders. The RCAF had now decided it wanted the Sparrow missile and the Astra fire control system, neither of them yet off the drawing boards in the United States. The Air Force wanted the best, and it was going to cost the country dearly. But it was not the Liberals who were going to pay the bill. In June 1957, John Diefenbaker became Prime Minister of Canada at the head of a Conservative government. And suddenly, Avro, created by the Liberals, found itself without friends in Ottawa. The Arrow was already a financial problem. Now, with hundreds of subcontractors dependent on the program, making everything from landing gear to delicate flight instruments, and with thousands of employees on the payroll, it was a political problem as well. On October the 4th, 1957, the Arrow made its first public appearance before an audience of dignitaries, Air Force officials, and workers. The Honorable George Perks, Minister of Defense in the new Conservative government, told his listeners that the coming missile age did not mean that the era of the manned airplane was over. The aircraft, he said, has this one great advantage over the missile. It can bring the judgment of a man into the battle. <laughs> 
Even as the curtains parted and the arrow was paraded into view, Russia was launching Sputnik, and the missile age was truly begun. The argument which Perks dismissed was within months to be used against the arrow by his own prime minister. But on that day, the builders of the arrow were counting the months and the weeks ahead until it should take flight. I understand the arrow will undergo high-speed taxiing tests within the next uh, three weeks, but when will it fly? It will fly uh, sometime during the period that it's undergoing these high-speed te taxi trials. Uh, you say within the next three weeks. This is when we would hope it will be doing its high-speed trials. And sometime uh, during that period, it will fly. And it did fly. On the 25th of March, 1958, Jan Zurakowski climbed into the cockpit of Arrow 201. He made a final instrument check pressed open the throttles and released the brakes. The arrow was ready for takeoff. I am coming in to take photographs. Stand by it. Every maneuver of the plane was recorded by cameras on the ground and in the two chase planes, piloted by Jack Woodman and Spud Potocki. Controls are behaving quite nicely. I can see no oscillatory motions of any description in them. I think all oh, this uh, immediate and the carriage is back to the old derivation disappears. I think the carriage is making this. That's right, this is the side door which is making, the door which comes and closes the undercarriage into it. In flight, the arrow performed like the thoroughbred she clearly was. All the attention to detail, all the elaborate test procedures of the past five years paid off in a flight that was virtually flawless. Uh, I'll be accelerating up to 250 now. Roger. In the laconic voices of Zurakowski and his countryman Spud Potocki, veterans of the Polish Air Force in Britain 13 years before, you hear the routine communication of two professionals examining the behavior of a piece of machinery as if this test flight were the most normal event in the world. The engines are behaving quite nicely. They are occasionally giving you a, a, a bit of a black puff of smoke uh, coming out of the mirror, but otherwise I can see there is no problem. That is Roger Yan, as far as I can see from the back, no condition has changed. Uh, switching out the dumpers now. Join please, 201. The wind is northeast at 10, the altimeter is 0, two, zero. On that first flight of 35 minutes, Zurakowski took the plane to 11,000 feet. On succeeding flights, it was to reach easily its target of 50,000 feet at nearly twice the speed of sound. Workers and managers and Air Force personnel left their shops and offices to watch the return of Arrow 201. Some had even brought their families. Zurakowski was later to say that he had never test flown an aircraft with so few problems. But there was something else. Canadians, used to seeing the leadership in technology in the hands of the United States and Britain, were suddenly aware that they had something which looked like the best in the world. And when Zora came down after this flight of this super airplane and the snag sheet showed the malfunction of two electrical switches out of 4,000 or thereabouts, we weren't surprised. I'm not, you know, I don't want to feel any arrogance about this, but the facts are we had done so much testing because of going straight into production that we had to be right. It was just unthinkable that, that anything could go radically wrong with that aircraft. And it was a very, very successful flight. But the first flight uh, was uh, very simple and very easy. From flying point of view, it didn't present any, any problems. 
And, you know, Zurichowski never told you what the hell went on when you, you uh, got him to fly an airplane. Because he, uh, he flew them for himself, I think, not for, for you. But uh, he was uh, certainly a superb pilot, <laughs> there's no question about it. 22 years ago, Reg Lane was a group captain in the RCAF attached to the Avro plant and the Arrow program. He recently retired as Brigadier General Lane, Deputy Commander of NORAD at Colorado Springs. He was one of the spectators in that crowd on the edge of the runway. It was absolutely magnificent when that aircraft flew the first time and the reports that were coming back from the test pilot and the various readouts of the test equipment that was on, on board the aircraft of the performance of the total machine. And of course it was, I think it was a second or third flight, I can't remember precisely when it actually went through Mach 1. Now that was a truly incredible accomplishment and in, those, in those days and uh, at that stage of the design of modern jet airplanes. Truly phenomenal effort. Well, of course, uh, everyone's spirits just rocketed when the initial reports came through on the first test flight of the airplane. And uh, we knew that we had a winner. It was a, a fantastic performing aircraft. I mean, Avro's commitment was to build an airplane that would give the Air Force 1.5 mark. Our performance boys thought we could do 1.6 mark with it. As it turned out, we actually flew that airplane to 1.9 mark number. and. Uh, had we continued the development of the Iroquois engine, uh, the Iroquois engine powered aeroplane, we had a lighter engine for more thrust, and we had a 2.3, 2.4 mark number potential. And in 1958, there wasn't another aeroplane in the world that was any near, anywhere near being competitive with this aeroplane. The project was just on a, had a lot of national pride. You know, you, you, you just go home at night and, and uh, people want to hear about it, and you tell them about it. I remember Bob Rice had a garage down the road from the airport, and he used to call me. I was taking off today, and I'd say, yeah, take what time? i said, oh, I don't know, probably about 10 o'clock. And he'd be out in front of the garage with his people. He wouldn't serve anybody, no gas, waiting for the airplane to take off and go over to a gas station. For the airplane, this is what everybody wanted, you know. It was something they could look at and say, hey, that's what we did in this country, and I think it was terrific. Through the summer of 1958, Arrows 201, 202, and 203 chalked up 57 flights, totaling some 61 hours. Each flight provided valuable lessons about the plane's capabilities. 204 made six flights beginning in October, and 205 flew only once on the 11th of January, 1959. But by that time, the Arrow was already under sentence of death. In the summer of 1958, General Perks and Finance Minister Donald Fleming had made an official visit to NORAD headquarters in Colorado. The American plan for North American defense included Canadian fighter squadrons, the radar warning system, and the Bullmark missile. Perks now became convinced that the bomber was becoming obsolete, that if Russia were going to attack North America, it would do so with nuclear missiles. The arrow would be useless against such an attack. If fighters were needed, he now had assurances from the Americans that the United States could make them available in quantity. The logic of this was not lost on his colleague, the Minister of Finance. The plane was becoming much more expensive to construct than had ever been uh, expected in the first place. Indeed, originally, uh, in thinking in terms of uh, manufacturing a much larger number of planes. The cost had been uh, estimated down as low as a million dollars a copy. Well, because of the disappearance of the hoped-for market, the cost was getting up to figures between eight million and twelve. In September 1958, the first blow fell. The Prime Minister announced that because of the rapid development of missiles, the government was not going to complete the full Arrow program. Crawford Gordon chose to believe the Arrow would not be cancelled. I want to stress most emphatically that the Arrow program has not been cancelled, nor has it been decided not to put it into production. <laughs> 
On the contrary, the Prime Minister's statement says the program is to continue. As it now stands, it involves the building of 37 aircraft and an appropriate number of engines. This situation remains unchanged, and we are convinced that when the review takes place next March, the Arrow will be ordered into production. There was no change in government policy since the announcement... But General Perks spelled it out. September. The Sparrow missile and Astra fire control systems were to be dropped. Work would continue on the 37 pre-production models, and that was all. Everybody in the country uh, buried the arrow. They said it was all finished and so on, but uh, we weren't prepared to accept that, and we went about our business to try to find out. We spoke to the political people in Ottawa on the one hand and the military on the other, and got two completely opposite. Now the company mounted a desperate campaign to reverse the decision. Fred Smy went to Washington to see the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force and extracted from him an extraordinary commitment. The U.S. Air Force was willing to fund the missile and fire control system as well as supplying test facilities as a virtual gift to the Government of Canada. And he authorized Smy to communicate this to the Minister of Defense Production, Raymond O'Hurley. On the next day, uh, I went to Mr. O'Hurley with a letter to this effect and uh, I stood there while he read it, uh, and that was the last we heard of that. No trace of that letter can be found in the National Archives. We have independent corroboration that it existed, but no evidence that it was ever seen by the Minister of National Defense, for example. Indeed, Mr. Perks later denied that there had been any offer of financial help from the Americans. If an air of mystery hangs over many of the decisions in the Arrow story, it is because so many files are either incomplete or closed to the public for a 30-year period. In any case, it appears that the letter would have made no difference. The government had already made up its mind. February 20th, 1959. For the thousands of people who were thrown out of work that day, it would be known as Black Friday. More than 20 years later, the memories are still fresh and painful. Well, um, about 9.30 in the morning, um, one of the fellows in the office telephoned his broker, uh, just an ordinary uh, inquiry on some stock prices. And toward the end of the conversation, um, he said, so by the way, how's AV Row Canada doing today? And I have to bear in mind that uh, there's a tremendous feeling of pride of working at uh, at Avro Aircraft and the Duranda engines at that time, people really enjoyed it and they bought stock in the company um, in the hopes that they would you know, succeed while the company succeeded. And uh, at any rate, the broker said, uh, no, let's see, AV Row Canada, oh, just a minute, there's something coming in over the ticker tape. And he waited a couple of minutes, came back and he says, we've just got a thing over the ticker tape that says that the Canadian Prime Minister has just announced in the House of Commons that the um, Avro Aero and Duranda Iroquois programs are to cease immediately um, and that was the extent of the thing on the ticker tape so the guy came back off the telephone sort of quite shaken obviously be about 10 30 10 just after 10 in any event as i stepped out in the hall coming running down the corridor very white in the face was joe morley who was my vice president of sales followed by alan hoare who was the ddp representative in the in the uh, company. And Morley said, the Prime Minister has just announced in the House of Commons that the Arrow, the Iroquois, have been cancelled. Two hours later, uh, around noon or after, um, Mr. Plant came on the loudspeaker system and said that everything had been cancelled. Every single contract the company had on the Arrow and uh, and on the Arena en the Iroquois engine and he read the telegram or cable which was sent and um, he said that um, under the circumstances and with no other contracts to fall back on of the kind that they had been pressuring the government to let them begin and take men off the arrow to start work on he had no alternative but to lay everyone off for the time being until they sorted out union priorities, uh, seniority, and 
what jobs they could salvage that could keep a few people busy and uh, that they would be called back after this was sorted out. When I got there, all the executives, the ones that were left, uh, were all standing around there with a drink in the hand. This is 10 o'clock in the morning. And some were partly loaded. And Gordon, uh, we're waiting for the telegram to arrive. We'd had it officially over the phone. And when it came, Gordon read it and he handed it to me and he said, somebody has got to take on that son of a bitch in Ottawa and I'm just the one to do it. Mr. Diefenbaker had said later that uh, the, the abrupt dismissal of 14,000 people was an attempt to embarrass the government. <laughs> well, we were only an agent of the government. Uh, anyone with any knowledge of, of government contract procedure or industrial practice would know that we had no alternative. Uh, the men were to stop work then, and they weren't to be paid then. There were no further costs to be incurred as far as the government was concerned. So you tell me what you do with 13,000 people with nothing to do. A sudden decision like this, it's, uh, it's going to cause panic in the place. That's for sure. I mean, whose side is he on? Is he trying to break the... He's trying to break the country, in my opinion. And $100 spent in, the, in this plant brings $65 back in taxes. That's been explained to all the public. He's going to give all those hundreds to the states. For why? Are they backing him? I would just like to say that I feel Mr. Diefenbaker has sold his country and his fellow Canadians down the river to American interests. I just have a couple of words to say to Mr. Diefenbaker. Be a Canadian, buy Canadian. Brampton is probably typical of scores of other Canadian towns. Population the cancellation created shockwaves in communities around the Avro plant. For CBC News, a young Morley Safer reported on its effects on the lives of workers and their families. themselves and their independence. But in fact, Brampton is dependent on one single industry. Small talk and gossip cover a single topic today. The end of the arrow. It's probably one of the more emotional uh, sort of experiences I've had in my life, I think, in a sense, because um, I think partly because of the tremendous personal involvement of everybody who worked there. there was a, um, I mean, if you can imagine secretaries uh, walking out from the design floor down the stairs, you know, with tears streaming down their faces and this sort of thing. And it wasn't just a few isolated ones, it was a lot of them, you know. It was, it was a very sort of emotional upheaval, I think. For weeks after that, people would wander into work just at a normal work time, just couldn't believe it had finished. You know, they'd walk around in days almost. They'd come in and sit at the board and walk around just as if nothing had happened. And there were about five, I don't recall the exact number, but about five of us left there to try and pick up the pieces and, and put the engineering together and package it and put it away so that it'd be left for posterity or burnt, maybe burnt. And in fact, the saddest thing on Black Friday was that uh, when we were in with the president of the company and we were holding a wake, if you like, on the announcement, and I couldn't believe it. I, I just went to, you know, almost was sick on the thing. What do we do with all these people and what do we do with my 1,500 engineers? My chief engineer came in who had been preparing the, the 206, which had the Air Corps engine in for first flight. And he said, I've heard about the cancellation. Can I fly 206? In other words, can I continue with the preparation of 206 for flight? And after consultation with Johnny Plant, who was the president of the company and the other directors, I just had to go and tell Bob Lindley, no, you can't fly that aircraft. So in fact, the aircraft, which would have bettered the specification, was a phenomenal aircraft, an all-Canadian project with a Canadian airframe, Canadian engine, never flew. In a warehouse in Ottawa is all that remains of Arrow 206, the plane that never flew. There are those who believe that with the Iroquois engine, it would have set world records for altitude and speed. And the Iroquois? It's now an exhibit in the aeronautical collection in Ottawa. There is no plaque to identify it. It seems a curious way to honor our achievements. And we still ask the question, what finally killed the Arrow?
think it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, uh, I felt personally, even though I was involved with it, the program should never have been started in Canada in the first place because it was just too expensive for us. However, it was started, and it, it, if they'd man, maintained it at its original idea, this might have gone through. But then when they added the um, cost of developing the Sparrow II and the cost of an Astra fire control system, uh, this just added to the cost. And if they hadn't been added, whether this would have made a difference, I don't know. Um, but the other thing is that um, if the two opposing people, and let's face it, there was a lot of uh, personalities involved in the cancellation of Mr. Diefenbaker and Crawford Gordon. And um, if either one of those two people had been different, uh, and preferably both of them, the cancellation could not have happened. I think it was in a, a very personal thing on this, in the final cancellation of the Arrow. Men of different temperament, different background. Gordon, contemptuous of the prairie lawyer who didn't understand industry. Diefenbaker, suspicious of the aggressive tactics of a Bay Street whiz kid. There were stories of a famous meeting in September of 1958. Although I'd never met Mr. Diefenbaker, I knew he had great respect for his office, for the office of prime minister. And I warned Gordon before he went to see him not to take a drink and not to smoke in his office, whatever he did. Well, Gordon must have been very belligerent. He had his half loaded when he got there. And uh, he puffed smoke in the old man's face all the time. And uh, it ended in uh, quite a bitter argument. And what you would use the term that the president was thrown out. But, you know, what's that got to do with the air defense policy of, of the government of Canada? Whether or not uh, Diefenbaker and Gordon had a personality clash, the only time they met was on that occasion, September the 17th, for about 20 minutes. That was their only meeting? Yes. Um, and what's it got to do with the air defense policy of Canada? Or the air or anything else? I haven't any idea of the real reason for the cancellation. So many reasons have been given. Mr. Diefenbaker even said that the chiefs of staff said they didn't want the airplane. Well, I don't believe that. I think the real reason for the, the cancellation was the, uh, the fact that they weren't sure that it was going to cost what we thought it was going to cost. And secondly, that Mr. Diefenbaker wanted to save some money somewhere. What is going to be done with the money, I don't know. But it has been stated to me by a man who now, now passed the Great Divide, who was in, in the know, that for about $50 million more than we'd already spent, plus the cancellation charges which we were going to spend, that we could have had uh, as many arrows as we had uh, voodoos. Two years later, Canada took possession of 66 second-hand voodoos bought from the Americans in a package deal. The voodoo was vastly inferior to the arrow, but the price was right. And what would C.D. Howe have done had the Liberals remained in power? In January 1959, he wrote to his leader, Lester Pearson, There is no doubt in my mind that the CF-105 should be terminated. Costs are completely out of hand. In this, the Liberals and the Tories were in agreement. It was an inevitable decision. No other decision under the circumstances could have been uh, responsibly made. Had we done something else, it would have simply meant taxing the people of Canada to go on uh, manufacturing planes for which there would never be a market outside Canada. And the Royal Canadian Air Force could uh, only uh, absorb so many. And as a matter of fact, it was, it was around this time that the whole role of the fighter aircraft had to be re-examined because the, uh, our, our concept of the defense of Canada uh, in relation to a possible attack changed from fear of the man bomber to fear of missiles. And the uh, Avro Arrow would never have been any use to us as a defense against missiles. Last September, I made it perfectly clear uh, that 
Having regard to the development that was then taking place, particularly in intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, that there was a probability that action would have to be taken in this regard. And that's the reason for the action. We were loath to take it. The Prime Minister used not money, but the missile threat as the major reason for the cancellation. In place of the arrow, we acquired the Bomark missile from the United States. The part that upset me was uh, basically in being asked to, to give some rationale behind the decision other than cost. And uh, we really couldn't do it because it was simply a cost matter. And then Mr. Dieferbaker uh, making the statement that uh, the introduction of the Bomark uh, was the reason uh, for uh, canceling the arrow. That it was a, a better interceptor, if you will and more effective and therefore the arrow could be cancelled. That was, that argument uh, was a very specious one and uh, literally had uh, no fact whatsoever. The RCAF was caught in the politics of the cancellation. Air Marshal Campbell was accused of not fighting hard enough for the arrow. Today he is reluctant to get involved in the controversy again. But he has told us that contrary to statements made by the Prime Minister, the Chiefs of Staff did not make a recommendation to cancel the Arrow, and that he offered his resignation if the Arrow were cancelled without provision for an alternative fighter. The alternative was the Voodoo, and the Bomark, and the Bomark was a failure. This model met the same fate as Arrow 206, lying a few meters away in the same warehouse. Whatever the Bomark was, it was no replacement for the Arrow. There was still another reason offered by the government for the cancellation. They tried to sell the Arrow before it entered squadron service, and they found they couldn't. Now, I went down to the United States in September and had conversations with their Secretary of Defense, find out whether they would be interested in our 105 see whether they'd be willing to purchase the 105 for even some of their squadrons. And the answer that I received was that they were not prepared at that time to do so. Mr. Perks, I reiterate, is, is a gentleman. Uh, I have the highest regard for him as a person. But he was a permanent army officer. He'd been retired from that for some time. He was over 70 years old. And he didn't know one end of an airplane from another. Uh, he had no appreciation of, of the industrial implications. He wasn't in a position to discuss the arrow or any aspect of it. And I there was another attempt to sell the arrow. In the winter of 1958, Donald Fleming and two other ministers met with their American counterparts in Paris to discuss defense. Fleming told them that the future of the arrow might depend on sales to the U.S. It was hardly a strong selling point. Conclusion of my statement. Mr. Robert Anderson, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, who was my opposite number in that committee, gave me the answer, no. It was an unconditional, uncompromising, and final answer. It was the decision of the United States government not to purchase the Arrow. And that decision spelled the doom of the Arrow program. Paul Hellyer, who later ran as a conservative, was liberal defense critic in opposition in 1959, and he still maintains that the government did not make the right kind of effort to sell the Arrow. I don't think the, the Arrow could have been sold to the United States directly, uh, because uh, the United States Air Force has an almost iron rule. They never buy anything that isn't invented in the United States. But what they do, and what I think might have been done, is that they sometimes help finance sales to other allies. And it's my belief that um, if Mr. Howe, for example, had still been around, that he could have done something. At that time, um, uh, Canadian real estate was still important to the United States. It's not now, but then it was. Uh, they had to count on us for the uh, radar lines and for a number of other facilities, for refueling facilities and so on. And uh, we had a lot of leverage, we had a lot of power at that time in negotiations and I think someone like Mr. Howe could have said all right you won't buy it this we understand this we know but we want your help in financing the sale of this aircraft to some of the other allies that you traditionally help and with his kind of persuasion I personally believe that it could have been done <laughs> 
Yes, on balance, I think it could have been sold. When you look at the attempts of the French to sell Mirage fighters or uh, other countries to sell weapon systems, you get the tremendous involvement, not only at the business level, but at the most senior political levels, where a prime minister or a president will go out to sell a program. Uh, I, don't, I don't think in this country that we have a tradition of involving the senior political community in selling weapon systems. And I think if that kind of pressure had been applied in relation to the United States, where there was a gap in weapon systems that the arrow could have filled, I think that could have been done. And it's a lesson we still have to learn, that if you're going to sell major programs, then you need major political effort in support of those programs. The Arrow was the most sophisticated weapon system this country had ever created. Its performance, even in the curtailed flight tests, placed it among the best in the world. But the sales effort that went along with it was amateurish and tentative. And when that failed, the Arrow met an ugly fate. In April 1959, Ottawa sent instructions to destroy the five Arrows that had flown and all the work on the assembly line. Men who had worked to build the planes were now ordered to cut them to pieces. As to who issued the order, whether it came from cabinet or from a bureaucrat, no one is telling. In Mr. Diefenbaker's uh, memoir, he, I think he said that, uh, that he was not aware of these instructions. But uh, I was aware of them because I was the fellow who received them. And like an idiot, I, I folded. And so I'm the person that issued the instructions to destroy the airplanes. And that's the worst mistake I ever made in my life. Cameramen were not allowed inside the plant to record the destruction. But one enterprising photographer rented a plane and took this series of aerial shots. They were cut up with torches in the, in the hangar there and hammered down with steel balls like they destroy buildings. After the aircraft were dismantled, the pieces were sold to a Hamilton junk dealer for six and a half cents per pound. At 67,000 pounds, a scrapped arrow would have cost you $4,355. A few weeks earlier, a request for one or more of the arrows had come from Britain for use in flight testing. The request was not refused. It was simply withdrawn, presumably on advice from Canada. Three could have been flown to England with two more to be used as backup spares of the first five we had flying. Canada wouldn't let them go. I mean, the reason is obvious. Had those aeroplanes ever got to Farnborough, and Farnborough realized the fantastic performance, I mean, Diefenbaker in no way have ever justified his cancellation of that program. And I'm sure that's why they were never let go. Well, the five arrows that had flown, and for which there was uh, uh, some interest on the part of the Royal uh, Aeronautic Establishment in Britain. They would want, wanted to take a couple of those and, and work further on research with them. Those were destroyed. Those were cut into scrap. Well, there, uh, I, I can't give you the detail now of the uh, issues that went into the destruction of a particular uh, copy. But I can tell you that in general, there was no deliberate destruction to do away with the arrow. Far, far from it. It was just a case of what was the economical way of disposing at that particular time of uh, various copies of the plane that were in various stages of production. And as you know, the, what happened after that, it was just like a de-Stalinization program. We were ordered to destroy all film on the, all original negative film on the Avra, Avra all the uh, still pictures, black and white, all stuff that had been developed during the flight test phases of the airplane. These were, Ottawa's instructions were to destroy these. They ordered us to destroy the airplanes by breaking them up. And uh, I think uh, the day I saw that uh, production line being put to the cutting torch, it's the nearest I'd come to shedding a tear over an airplane. It was pathetic. Looking back on this extraordinary event, the scrapping of the arrow still seems an act of either inspired malevolence or of criminal stupidity. A mocking epitaph to the work of the men and women who built her. Did you see any aircraft being destroyed? No. No. I could have if I wanted to, but I didn't. I couldn't. I don't think any people wanted to go and watch such a massacre. <laughs> 
frightening sight. The people who were part of the Arrow story are now 21 years older. David Golden was then Deputy Minister of Defence Production. He is now the head of Telesat Canada, the satellite agency. And he has not changed his mind about whether cancelling the Arrow was the right thing to do. It's not, in my view, something that one can be dogmatic about, but I would certainly come down on the side of saying yes, painfully, regrettably, it was the right decision at the time under all the circumstances and I think so now too. Well, you've got to look at it from various points of view, you know, from the country's point of view, was it a mistake? Uh, I think uh, that you really can't afford to uh, abdicate from this, the thrust of technology. Um, the airplane was a good airplane. Uh, it probably would have sold a hell of a lot of copies. If you have to look at it strictly from the standpoint of defense. And uh, the amount of defense dollars that the era was going to take, then I don't really think that the government had any choice. Certainly, it would have taken all of the defense money that was then available. The Navy and the Army would have had nothing. They would have been totally bereft for years. And this, from their standpoint, I think was, it was untenable. If you look at it from the national standpoint, in other words, you ignore the defense budget and say, what is the best thing for Canada, for our industrial base, for our scientific base, for our um, national base, our feeling of Canadianism, for the great things that we're capable of doing, then personally, I think it was a disastrous decision. Well, again, looking back, uh, the loss, the enormous loss that we have endured uh, in the people and in the technology, one wonders if it would not have perhaps been uh, worth it to have accepted those higher costs at that day to retain that uh, type of talent and technology here in Canada. But that's hindsight, and hindsight's 2020 version. And in those days, well, I don't think anyone really appreciated the impact, the enormous impact downstream, 10 years, 15 years later, of that decision. And the consequences? One of them was a shot in the arm for the American Moon Project. A number of top engineers were immediately snapped up by NASA. Brian Erb, a young engineer, developed the heat shield for the Apollo spacecraft. Len Packham, in charge of the rocket test program with Avro, worked on the telemetry system for the first manned rocket launchings. And Jim Chamberlain, chief technician at Avro, was project director for Gemini and is now with McDonnell Douglas in Houston. Engineer Ken Cook went from Avro straight to McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. He's now a systems engineer on the F-18, which his company hopes to sell to Canada for two and a half billion dollars. It seems the era of the manned interceptor is not over after all. But it's unlikely we'll ever have another arrow. Shortly after the cancellation, we signed a defense production sharing agreement with the U.S., tacitly agreeing never again to undertake production of a major weapon system on our own. The question returns. Can a country the size of Canada ever compete in the business of building costly weapons of war? The immediate impression is to say, no, you can't afford them. But when you look at Sweden, which has a third hour population and which has an incredibly strong aircraft industry, they have managed to establish a strong defense program, a stable plan, plan program, a very strong aircraft industry. And although they're in some difficulties now, they've done that for the last 20 or 30 years. So it simply is feasible if the planning and the purpose is there over a sufficiently long term. But it's, I think it's a characteristic of Canada. We really haven't learned to capitalize on the genius that we're able to create from time to time in this country. We don't support research and development. We go so far and then back off. Canada can do it if it, if it wants to be in that kind of business, uh, if it wants to uh, build its economy, if it wants to develop that sense of commitment, then we have all the other resources that are, uh, that are available to do it. The manpower, the finance, uh, the marketing ability uh, is all there in a native sense. <laughs>
The end of the Arrow was to be the end of the company. It was also the end of Crawford Gordon. Sir Roy Dobson, wheeling and dealing to keep the company alive, fired the man he once thought of as a son and felt compelled to write a letter to John Diefenbaker to tell him so. It's addressed to the Right Honorable John G. Diefenbaker. It begins, Dear Mr. Prime Minister, I sent word via Mr. Guest that I have asked for and received the resignation of Mr. Crawford Gordon as president of A.V. Row Canada Limited on the grounds that I was most dissatisfied with the way he has been working and with his actions, which could not be considered to be in the best interest of the company or the country. It's signed by Sir Roy H. Dobson, by Roy H. Dobson. Eight years later, Crawford Gordon died in New York. His friends said he drank himself to death. He could handle success, but not failure. And what of the other personalities in the Arrow story? After the cancellation, James Floyd moved back to Britain. In a distinguished career, he saw two of his aeroplanes, both of them pioneering ventures, both cancelled. He is now retired, still working as a consultant in the aviation industry and still a Canadian citizen. Fred Smy bought an office equipment company, got tired of it, and in 1972 moved to Portugal. He is writing a book about Avro and the Arrow. He regards himself as being in voluntary exile. Jan Zurakowski retired a few months before the cancellation and now owns a fishing lodge in northeastern Ontario. The arrow is long dead, but the controversy lives on with its memory. People still argue its merits. Was it as good, as great as its supporters would have us believe? Here are three answers. If you mean by the arrow, uh, I take it, a fighting uh, instrument of war, uh, which uh, must include an aircraft, an engine, and a sophisticated fire control system, then, of course, there never was an arrow in those terms. I think everybody will agree that is factual. But I think it's a mistake and gets people somewhat worked up in a way that they ought not to, to talk about the cancellation of this great Canadian achievement, when in fact it may very well have turned out to be a great achievement, but it seems to me that at the time it was cancelled, it was too soon to say whether the hopes that everyone held out for it were going to be realized or were not. Aircraft nowadays are maybe more sophisticated in this or that and better engines, better fuel consumption, better pressure recoveries. But there's nothing that I know of that would, even now, today, uh, be an improvement on that uh, maneuverability capability. It, it was absolute state of the art. It was a, a beautiful machine and we probably would still be flying it today. In losing the arrow, we lost not only a symbol of national pride, we lost the technology and an immense pool of talent. There is one final question among the legacy of questions left by the death of the arrow. To what extent did American interests influence the cancellation? The answer appears to be not at all. Although American space technology was the great beneficiary when the arrow was killed, the United States did nothing to bring it about. They didn't have to. We did it all ourselves. I'm behaving quite nicely.